So tonight, uh, I am up here along with Jonathan Lehman, the editorial director at Nine Marks, uh, in order to engage in conversation a few friends. Tom Schreiner, uh, professor of New Testament at Southern Seminary. Tom, are you here? Tom, if you're here, please come up here. You do us no good there, brother. You have to come up here. Come up higher. Thank you. Typical humility. Welton Bonner, a church planter in Washington, D.C., uh, with a Ph.D. in biblical studies in the Old Testament in Isaiah to balance out Tom's knowledge of the New Testament. And uh, Mike Law, Jr., a uh, pastor at Arlington Baptist Church in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, especially notorious this week. Yeah, that's good right there. Um, so, friends, what we're planning to do uh, is to, first of all, hear some remarks from Jonathan Lehman as he sets up how we should think about this biblical and theological and pastoral issue uh, that's facing our convention this week. And then we'll be having some conversation between us uh, that Jonathan will be leading. That's, that's the rough outlines of the plan. Uh, let me now hand things over to Jonathan. I've been asked to ask you to stand up. And move in, leaving the empty seats on the outside, if you can. Move in. Fire marshal wants everybody to be down, I guess. And you can sit once you have your seat. All right. The title, the title of this talk is the pastor, office, or gift? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. I'm going to try to do this in nine points, appropriately. And I'm going to try to do this under 12 minutes. Let's see if I can do it. All right, it should go. Nine points. Number one, some argue the pastor is a gift, not an office. Rick Warren has been saying that. Before that, Sam, uh, Sam Storms. Uh, Harold Honer at DTS said it for a number of years. It rests primarily on the language in Ephesians 4, where, of course, in verse 8, you see the word gift. Then that's attached to verse 11, where Paul says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds in the ESV, or the pastor in the CSB or the NIV, poimenos, and teachers. And the argument is that since Paul uses the language of gifts and giving, then those titles must not be authoritative offices, like elder or overseer, but gifts. So I guess the implication is if you're a pastor here tonight, you're not a gift. Sorry, guys. Or if you're an elder, you're not a gift, is the point. Uh, only those who have the gift of pastor, which is separate from elder, are the gift. Uh, Honer argues that the discussion of elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 comes with a list of qualifications where those lists of gifts in Ephesians 4 don't come with a list of qualifications. And he says that's a reason to think they're separate things. But then again, just follow through the implication of that. If that's the case, does that mean you can be a pastor without qualifications? Is that what you're arguing? That would seem a little strange. Um, of course, there's no consideration that it might be a both and. The men given as elders or pastors or teachers are gifts. Number two, the argument calls pastor a gift, not an office, I get this, in order to justify an office. Now, if the argument was some are gifted pastorally, I could make sense of it. For instance, I'd be able to say, hey, my, my wife has certain pastoral gifts. She's, she's sensitive and conscientious and helps counsel people. She can teach well from God's word. She's gifted pastorally. I can say that. But of course, that's not what's being asked. What's being asked is that we place women into an office inside of a church building with a nameplate on a door and attached to the payroll. What is that? It's an office, right? According to Kevin McClure's study published on Saturday in the American Reformer, just this last Saturday, based on his survey of 3,800 
47 SBC churches, there's approximately 1,844 female pastors serving in 1,225 SBC churches. Of those, 23% are youth pastors, children pastors, or family pastors. 19% are associate or assistant pastors. 6% are senior pastors. 5% are executive pastors. 9% are youth pastors, and so forth. In other words, the purpose of distinguishing between the gift and office is to create another office. I trust those making the argument are sincere and honest, but the whole thing just feels specious to me. And further, as someone who has spent nearly a decade and a half working on church polity, let me just say, you cannot go into the New Testament, grab a single word, gift, and build an entire church structure around it. Lots of people have done that in church history. That's not a good way to build your church structure. Take a single word and say, oh, let's build on that. And also, if you're going to say the gift of pastor is different from the office of elder, then you need to tell me what, okay, what, what exactly is the, the, the job of the pastor versus the job of the elder, and where are you going to go in the Bible to get those two descriptions of jobs? And also, if you're going to have a job, you have a set of responsibilities, which is to say a lane of authority. So what's exactly the authority of the pastor versus the authority of the elder? Where is that specified? None of these things are explained. It's just like, well, you have a gift and you have an office, as if the conversation is over. Number three, shepherd or pastor is an Old Testament title. Shepherd or pastor is an Old Testament title. Unfortunately, this entire conversation has been divorced from a biblical theology of shepherding. And shepherds and throughout the Bible protect, feed, lead the sheep. Moses was counted as a shepherd who watched over the flock of God in the wilderness. David, the shepherd, was counted as a royal shepherd who pointed towards the true shepherd. And the prophets, of course, indict the bad shepherds the kings and princes of the Old Testament for leading sheep astray. My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them on the mountains, says the Lord through Jeremiah. Therefore, God promises, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. Yet not only that, he says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3 and 24. So notice the bad shepherds are indicted for their bad character and ungodliness. Is it any surprise then that God would tie the office of elder or pastor to character qualifications? Number four, Jesus is the good shepherd who calls under shepherds. The Davidic shepherd came, his name is Jesus, he's the good shepherd, he knows the sheep and they hear his voice and they follow and he's not given up one that the Father has given to him. And not only that, this chief shepherd gives gifts of under shepherds to the flock of the church. Here's Peter using the language of elder and shepherd interchangeably. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Clearly, Peter is speaking to the elders, and he's telling them to shepherd. The same word as pastor, pastor or shepherd, under the chief shepherd, right? So if elders are called to undertake the work of shepherding or pastoring, and if a pastor is somehow a separate office, well, then what's the work of pastoring, if not shepherding? Uh, Again, you you only get one job here set out, and that's what elders do. And, And the word shepherd is never used, the verb shepherd is never used outside of the context of what elders or overseers do. Number five. The idea of shepherding is used interchangeably with elder and overseer. I showed you one example in 1 Peter 5. Another example is Acts 20. Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. When they came, he said to them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Overseers, those over the flock, elders, similar as in 1 Peter 5. Number six, there's two basic offices in the New Testament, elder and deacon. 
not three, elder, pastor, deacon. Now, amidst the flurry of job titles that we use so commonly today, I think it's easy to lose our bearings. We, we use a lot of them. Senior pastor, executive pastor, children's pastor, children's director, music pastor, music director, worship leader, minister of music, administrator, Sunday school administrator, Sunday school director, secretary, administrative assistant, ministry assistant, and so on. We're a bit promiscuous with our use of titles. <laughs> and insofar as we are, it's easy to lose our biblical bearings Okay, fine. They serve good organizational purposes. I'm, I'm not against titles as such. I'm just say, saying, as you think through titles, you want those two basic buckets, right? I, I kind of want things to fit into that lest business think or corporate think shape our church. I, I just want to keep my mind in those two basic buckets. Buckets. Philippians 1, to the saints in Christ Jesus who, who are at Philippi with the overseers, elders, pastors, and deacons. Number seven, tie every job to elder qualifications or deacon qualifications. This is building on the last point. And I think placing every job into those two buckets, whatever title you use finally, protects the biblical and moral integrity of the church. For instance, uh, Paul says a deacon must not be double-tongued. Do you want your church secretary to be double-tongued? Probably not. As I read through the qualifications of, of deacon in the New Testament, or deaconess, it's hard to find one that I wouldn't want the church secretary to have, Right? And so with the administrator and the director and then this, the Sunday school, whatever, this or that, either, either the qualifications of an elder or the qualifications of a deacon, right? right? Two buckets. Number eight, choose titles that reinforce the biblical division of labor and doesn't blur or confuse, him, uh, confuse them, especially by paying attention to the nouns in those titles. Like pastoral assistant, the noun is assistant versus assistant pastor. Pay attention to the nouns. And save the title of pastor or elder, whatever adjective you might place in front of it, administrative, executive, youth, for those who are elder qualified. Don't call somebody a youth pastor who's not a pastor or an elder. And be careful with the term minister. Minister is one that's kind of thrown in, especially in kind of Lutheran settings, and it can be very ambiguous. I say never use it, I'm just saying be careful with it. Number nine, affirm the necessary and indispensable work of women in the church because they too are priests. There's another title. Women's contribution to the mission of the church is not just important or vital or critical. Women are essential and indispensable to the church's mission and ministry. Why? Because they too are new covenant priests who have received the great commission. Is it the status of a pastor or elder our churches should ultimately exalt or the status of being a Christian and a new covenant priest? Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands me and knows me. And we're all that. And the Great Commission comes to all of us. And we have work to do. It's not just given to pastors or elders or overseers. One conversation that might be worth exploring is whether elder rule churches, which I'd say possess a diminished view of the member, engender a greater sense of the divide between men and women. Might a vigorous congregationalism help us to better see the necessary and indispensable work of men and women in the church? And that is the conversation, among other things, we're going to have now. It's 12 minutes exactly. All right. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we have Mike Law, who is pastor of Arlington Baptist and somewhat involved in this convention, and Tom Schreiner, who was in the first edition of the CBMW book, right? Didn't you write in that? So you've been there since the 80s. Long time. Yeah. Sometimes I'm talking to Tom about this, and he's like, there's complementarianism, and he's like, is there anything else to say? Haven't we said it all? 
kind of. But I, I think you just said it all. <laughs> and then Welton, who's been a pastor, who's presently in the process of planning or getting ready to plant and as an Old Testament PhD, as Mark said. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mike. Why are we having this conversation right now? If we've been living under a rock, we don't know everything going on, what's going on? Why are we having this conversation? We're having this conversation because there are sisters in Christ serving as pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention, and that has come to light. And we are at a moment about whether or not we are going to submit ourselves joyfully to God's word and his good design for his people. And I think that we're here and I'm, I'm confident and uh, hopeful that we will stand on scripture. And what's your role? What have you done? I'm the ingrown hair of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> I'm certainly a, a part of the body and welcome, but I'm that very doesn't irritating. doesn't sound like a good thing. No, I'm very irritating right now, but I think relief is coming on Wednesday. So, um, so my, my role is uh, simply pointing out that, look, for, for me, uh, over, over a year ago, I realized that there were five churches within a five mile radius of my congregation who had women serving on staff as pastors. And as, as I thought about uh, unbelievers looking up a church uh, in, in my area and, and thinking, you know, I, my parents took me to a Southern Baptist church growing up and I, I know they preach the Bible and I, I'm pretty sure that's what I need to hear right now. If they look up a church, it's very possible that they would find a church that doesn't stand with scripture on this issue. Uh, and I was, I was concerned about that. We have a lot of people, I'm sure this happens on Capitol Hill too, but we have a lot of people who have, you know, as it may put it, wandered away from the faith for a time and they're kind of coming back in their 20s or so and they, they want to figure out where they're at with the Lord. And so I, I, I became concerned about that and want to raise that issue. Yeah, and Mike, just to follow up on that, the, um, the experience that I had, say, in my MDiv, I was at Gordon-Conwell back in the 1980s and almost all the people, well, that's not quite true, most of the people who taught me were egalitarians. Uh, they believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. They believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. So I think they were my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I think they were wrong on this issue. And I think what Mike is imagining when that person mythically in this area decides to go to a Southern Baptist church is that if, some, if a congregation is wrong on this point, that very well could be, in a way I would say differently even than it was 40 years ago in the 1980s, very well could be an indicator of the slippage of the authority of Scripture just throughout. Uh, so let me be the first to introduce the slippery slope argument, because that's always despised and often true. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's, uh, you know, if, if you see a church that looks at Scripture when it seems to be so clear, Tom thought he said everything he needed to about this in the 1980s. Can't imagine we're having the conversation yet again then if they can set that aside, what else have they set aside or are they willing to set aside? Is that fair, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> now, to predict Rick Warren's response from his open letter, our appeal to reverse the executive committee regarding them coming back and ruling is not asking the Baptists to change their theology, not at all. The overwhelming majority of Southern Baptists are complementarian, but we reject the idea that Southern Baptists who disagree are an existential threat to our convention and not true Baptists. And later, this is why our church is challenging the ruling, not for ourselves, but for the future and nature of the SBC, which hangs in the balance. So, so, so Mike and brothers, are, are we trying to make evangelism harder? Are we overreacting here? I mean, what's really at stake? He's saying we, we, can, we can agree to disagree on this one. Why not? precisely because of what Mark just said a minute ago, I think. I mean, Tom, you can speak on things other than just exegesis of the New Testament. you have any comment on this? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, that's what our, our confession of faith is clear. We have a confession of faith. We've agreed upon that confession of faith. So on what basis can we say we're just going to dispense with what's in our confession of faith. I, I think that's a huge problem. Sure, there are other Baptists who don't hold to our particular confession of faith, but we have a particular confession of faith, which we abide by. Welton? I think to a certain extent, 
This question is a question of love. Is it most loving to our neighbor to disobey scripture to accommodate to them? And I think if we're thinking soberly about it, then we would recognize that love actually rejoices in truth. And so I, I think when we recognize that, I think they're trying to play the hero. We're the hero of the oppressed situation. And I get it because it can sound like to some, oh, we're just attacking our sisters. We don't have anything. We don't want to see them prosper. And, it's, and that's just a straw man argument because our dear sisters in the Lord, they are so gifted in ways, but, they, but by confusing the gift of teaching with the office of elder, they are producing um, a lot of confusion. And so we're trying to lovingly direct our churches and our congregations in such a way where they accord to scripture, which glorifies our God, who we're ultimately trying to love. Hey, Mark, do you remember that time when we were at that conference and I had a Bible with Tom there? I kind of flipped through it and I put my finger down in the New Testament and I said, what is it in the Greek? Do you remember that? Ah, uh, never mind. <laughs> I'm going to try it again. Hey, Tom, Ephesians. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I do remember. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians 4 8 in the Greek, what is it? Ephesians what? 4 8. About leading. What are we asking this for? <laughs> leading. leading. Well, it's one part in education, Greek. it's other part party trick. Tom, yeah, 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 that's right. You know, I, I know Jonathan. Like leading well. in the Greek, captive. captive. In the Greek, what is Ephesians 4 8? Can you say it to us in Greek? No. Oh, come on. Are you sure I you can? I bet you can. No, I cannot. Bobby could, but I'm, I'm you know. Okay, how about 11? Can you do so, 11? Pardon? Verse 11. I, would you I wanna, mean. Would, you, would an English translation help? You could kind of paraphrase, riff Reverse off of that. translate? <laughs> I mean, you really want me to do this? So, <laughs> I, th I think he does. So, I mean, we have the word apostles, apostolos. Prophetes, euangelistes, poimenos, and didaskalos, right? Okay, those are the four words. Yeah, or didaskalos. And in verse eight, we use that word gift. Is it verse eight? Charisma. He gave gifts to men. Yeah, is that the word domata there? I, I can't remember, actually. Is it domata or, or is it charis? I think both words are used in the passage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Are those gifts those four things well i think in the text he talks about gifted people right when we look at the text it's so if, if we want to be precise he's talking about gifted people right okay apostles are prophets the, are they offices we don't refer to the office of evangelist think, or the office think, of teacher as such well, I, I would argue that, that this text isn't trying to answer that question, so I think some of them are offices and some aren't. I think apostleship is an office. I think pastoring is an office. I, I don't think that's true of evangelists and uh, prophecy and teaching. So, I mean, verse, is it verse 11, is very controversial. I think um, all pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. But not, not everyone understands the text that way. But, but that's my reading. Now, it is a unique usage, isn't it, of, of pastor or shepherd in the New Testament as a title? It's the only use of the noun. Right, that's what I mean. You right, the verb. exactly. The verb, the, and you mentioned those passages in 1 Peter 5 of the elders who oversee, and Acts 20, Paul summons the elders, and he calls them the elders of Ephesus, and he calls them uh, overseers. overseers in verse 28. And then he says, a shepherd, as a verb, the flock of God. But this is the only, the only use of the noun for church leaders. Shepherd or pastor. Does that give you any doubt about uh, the position that pastor and elder are, in fact, interchangeable terms? The fact that it's the only usage in the, as a noun in Ephesians 4.11, could, could it be there's something to Honer, Storms, Warren's argument? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think even the text we just mentioned, the 
the elders and overseers shepherd the flock. That, that verbal form, I think, confirms when we come to Ephesians 4 that we ought to read that noun in terms of what elders and overseers do. I, I think an interesting text is 1 Peter 2, 25. Jesus is called the overseer, the episcopon, and the shepherd, the, the pastor of our souls. So those, those two words are very closely related, right? And they both speak mainly of function. You oversee a flock, you shepherd, you pastor a flock. So I, I think that's a little bit of indirect evidence, but further evidence that pastors and overseers are the same office, pastor, overseer, elder. Pastor and overseer emphasize the function. So they're very, very close, right? They're almost synonymous in 1 Peter 2.25. As I understand it, that's kind of the whole New Testament conversation right there, because that, that's the only argument that's being made. Am I missing something? Are there any other questions for Tom on the exegesis? Well, I, of I just think another point you made that was very important in, the, in those Old Testament references, the pastors are leaders, right? yeah. they're, 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 they're kings, they're leaders, and often in those Old Testament texts, uh, the word pastoring or shepherd, if we use the word shepherd, that's how it's usually translated, is, is linked with the words leader or, or king. Yeah. So I, I think that's further evidence that we're talking about leaders. It's, again, it's not direct in the congregation, which are the elders, the overseers, pastors. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know the history, but I, I take it that's the way the church has always interpreted it. I haven't looked into that. I'm going to come to that history in a second. But Weldon, any insights on the Old Testament usage of shepherd or pastor? Or Yeah, so what we find, first and foremost... Yahweh is the shepherd of Israel. Psalm 23, several other, of the other Psalms reference him as such. Um, but then we also see Israel's first, you know, heavyweight uh, representative, and that's Moses. And he kind of functions as a priest, prophet, and a little bit like a king as well. And then we see the, the second big name come around is David. And he is the shepherd of Israel. And both of them, ironically, are shepherding before they're called. And so what we find in several of the passages, like, uh, for example, um, another, another example of king equaling, equaling shepherd is in Isaiah 44, 28, where the Lord references Cyrus as he is my shepherd. So also... Ezekiel 34 would be another instance of shepherds primarily referencing kings. And even and that's not even exclusive to the Israelite culture and context. It was an ancient Near Eastern background. Hammurabi's Law Code, one of the earliest law codes that we have still extant. And he refers to himself as the shepherd of his people and he's leading them. So the, the, the office of, of king was related to the shepherd. And so if that has any um, credence to the New Testament, picking up on that metaphor, that Old Testament metaphor and applying it to the leaders of the church, there's a lot of wisdom to be gained, at least in the sense that they were males. And the times where we see that pattern broken are egregious. One example is that is grotesque is Athaliah. She is a woman who usurps authority. Uh, she kills off her offspring so that she can reign in Judah for several for about six years. And so it, that what we find over and over again when there is kind of going back to Genesis three that that quest for power that can occur in the power struggles uh, between male and female in our fallen creation, it can, it often is painted in negative pictures in scripture. Jezebel is another example. Any questions or comments on Welton, the Old Testament? One, one, again, it just seems to me the exegesis, the Bible conversation here is, is pretty simple and clear. Am I Maybe when we come to a Q&A in a bit, y'all might have other questions on this topic. 
But moving on to a slightly different one, if you again you explore Rick Warren's website devoted to this, he talks a lot about how women are called to do Great Commission ministry. Are we restricting women's Great Commission ministry by limiting, or saying the Bible limits this particular office to men? I'm interested in how many of us would say that women could not be evangelists on this panel? Would any of us say that? And so if evangelists are primarily taken with the proclamation of the gospel to the lost, I don't see how we're accused as those who are hindering the Great Commission. Also, I think the confusion between um, people who are making this argument, they're saying, you're limiting the women's gift. And we're saying, well, actually, she can still teach. It's just God has provided parameters and boundaries on whom she is to te teach to in the gathered assembly. And so that is not to, that, that means there's a whole other groups that are a part of the local church that she can use that gift in. But that office is distinct from the gift in that and the office of elder includes the gift of teaching, but it is, it is more than that. And that's where we have the, the prerequisites. I'm just curious, if you were converted as a child, so 11 or younger, please stand. If you think you were converted as a child, 11 or younger, please stand. Keep, keep standing. Everybody just look around. Now, if your mother had nothing to do with that, please be seated. If your mom had nothing to do with that, please be seated. Okay, everybody can be seated. Yeah, I think the Great Commission has been worked on all over the place here by uh, our sisters. Thank God. Why does that assertion reveal a poor understanding of ministry? Well, we, we sometimes just forget. We, we think all ministry is, is a pulpit. We think all ministry is adults. We just forget that so much of ministry takes place in the family. So much of the ministry takes place among friendships. So much of the ministry takes place in conversations. You know, how, 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 much, how, much of, how much of the New Testament has word ministry that's not from the pulpit out, as important as that is, but one anothering. There's just so much of the ministry of the word uh, that takes place in a way that's not limited to what elders or pastors are called uniquely to do in the congregation. Mark or anyone, is there, was there a distinction between elders and pastors in the first century, second century, third century, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, somewhere before us now? It, uh, I have not done work on this, so I, this is just from general reading and memory. So Ignatius, second century, separates bishop and elder. An elder, the, the bishop in that sense is above the elder and is in charge of a number of elders. Yeah. But that, yeah, and that's, the, that's there we go, and the, the rise of the early monarchical episcopate. Yeah. So that develops as a matter of administration, uh, practical authority. Uh, I don't remember how that was theologically defended, if it needed to be theologically defended. Yeah. 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 So, so, so just to, to wrap that up, then at the Reformation where the authority of Scripture, the perspicuity and authority of Scripture is rediscovered, I think people pretty quickly saw etymologically the usage that Tom has brought out of the interchangeability between shepherd, pastor, overseer, bishop, and elder, pres priest, presbyteros. Th those three were used in the New Testament interchangeably. And the question was more, do we need to follow that pattern? Or are those patterns largely not significant for us? Are we left free to do whatever we want in terms of polity? So in many ways, the Reformation is, is a succession in terms of polity in the 15 and 1600s of kind of three waves of Reformation. First, you get the gospel. And then you, so you start having bishops in the Church of England who believe the gospel, like John Hooper. 
And then you start to get the reformed types uh, in the 1530s and 40s on the continent, and then their advocates, 1570s, 80s, uh, Cartwright, uh, uh, William Perkins, ultimately, uh, others then in England, who are starting to come in, who are beginning to change and wonder, well, should we adopt this more Presbyterian, what we now call Presbyterian form of government, which is what you see going on at the Westminster Assembly. Uh, they're the majority, not unanimous, but the majority, think that there is an interlocking series of courts that is a plural eldership that's to replace the role of the bishops. But then in the 15, I mean the 1630s, 40s, 50s, you start having people noticing the congregational texts and advocating that actually there are things the gathered assembly is to do that aren't really left for the elders alone. And that's where you get into the famous passages, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 6, 1 Timothy 4, 3, uh, Galatians chapter 1, where Paul appeals to all the Christians, not just the elders, to judge the apostle and the gospel the apostle preaches, even if it's Paul himself. So there's all kinds of things that people like John Cotton uh, get to be sensitive to, that then John Owen flips on, and, and lots of, of people then in the, in the later 1600s begin having a polity, more like what you and I would understand there is. And so we're back around to those three words, bishop, elder, pastor, being used interchangeably by the Congregationalists. With the Reformed or the Presbyterians, they knew that. They weren't sure how significant it was. And with the Episcopalians, they kind of knew it, but they didn't think it was significant. Well, and then if you look at Baptist faith, the history of the Baptist faith and message, sometimes it refers to elders and deacons. Sometimes, it refers, had elders in the sometimes it refers to pastors and deacons. But there's still that understanding of the interchangeability of those three terms. It kind of still on the historical side, but then moving into the present moment. One of the assertions that's often made is that Baptists historically care more about our partnership in missions and evangelism, and therefore allow for some discrepancies at these second order level, like some preach the Lord's Supper this way, some practice the Lord's Supper that way. Well, we can allow for that. And even in first order issues, we this view of salvation, that view of salvation, whether Calvinistic or non-Calvinistic, we allow for those differences. Why are we, is it consistent with what we've been historically to sort of batten down the hatches on this one? Any, anybody. Okay, in the 1830s, one-third of the Baptist churches in the Ohio Valley became Campbellite, with the argument that Alexander Campbell used no creed but the Bible. That was the Campbellite anti-Baptist argument. That's not a Baptist argument. The only Baptists who ever used that were the moderates in the 1970s and 80s trying to defend against the conservative resurgence. The Baptists were famous for making more confessions than anybody. Every Because we had our own authority in each local congregation. You know, so yes, you might have a New Hampshire or a 1689. You had tons of Baptist churches out there just making their own. That's what Baptists do. They're just congregational. So they're making up their own. So it, it wasn't that they were anti-creedal or anti-confessional. Now, there have been Baptists who have been. W.B. Johnson, the first president of the Southern Baptist Convention, was anti-confessional. But he sticks out because he was about the only one. I mean, all the other Baptists didn't have a cottage industry for 30 years riding against him. So, so you, can, you can find this out, go do your doctoral work, enjoy that. So that's, uh, that's, that's Baptists, no creed but the Bible. That's Alexander Campbell's anti-Baptist line, meaning it to mock the Baptists. Uh, then in the 20th century, you can pick up uh, mission unites, doctrine divides. Yeah, that's the World Council of Churches. Uh, that's liberalism trying to get rid of clear evangelical Bible teaching doctrine. Uh, you know, mission unites, doctrine divides. Now, can we foolishly and unnecessarily divide over doctrine? Of course we can. Is that a problem among Bible-believing Christians? Yes, that has been a problem uh, from, from the time of the apostles till now. Uh, dividing wrongly. Not dividing sometimes when we should, dividing when we don't need to. But that doesn't mean that it is by category wrong or foolish of us to divide over doctrinal issues. Uh, we've not come to a meeting this week of the Southern Presbyterian Convention. Uh, you know, we, I believe I have many Presbyterian brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet we have differences that are so significant that we have bound together as Baptists on issues that we do not think are salvific, but very important, 
particularly essential for how we're going to have a church. And so it's the Southern Baptist Convention, and I don't think we're wrong or unnecessarily divisive in order to cooperate together on that basis. Well, I think the other thing to recognize here is that your doctrine of the church and even your church structures are those very things given by God to protect the gospel. So the gospel creates the church, but the church and its structures protects, displays, holds up from one generation to the next, the gospel. So as soon as you lose your local church and its structures, you're going to have Christians, but that Christianity is not going to pass on very long. It's going it's to dissipate because it's the church and those second tier things that we want to make sure we agree on that are part of protecting the first tier things. That's why this is not just an arbitrary conversation. Uh, Ma- Mike, anything on what you're hearing? Um, well, I, w- I wanted to say two things. Um, first of all, doctrine drives our declaration of Jesus, right? So any true unity for mission has to be unity and the truth together. And I, I think also that we, we disregard the generosity of our good God when we set aside uh, the doctrine and, and the way in which he's structured his church, right? Ephesians 4 talks about how Jesus gave gifts to his church, He's already given his life for us, and he's given us gifts. Pastors are gifts to his church. And, and failing here, faltering on the, the pastoral office, the teaching office, and the life of the church is exceedingly dangerous and disregarding a, a, a great gift of our Savior to us. And can I add something here? I think, um, I mean, what we've seen so far is the mainline churches then embraced female pastors in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now they're LGBTQ+. I, I want, we want to be careful of a slippery slope, but, but I am concerned. I, I think I see it in some evangelical circles. I think that same movement is very tempting. There's a lot of pressure on us today to move, to move in those uh, directions. And, and, and why is that? It's because the biblical argument in both cases against homosexuality and against female pastors, I, I'm not arguing they're equally clear. I'm not saying that, but I think the biblical argument in both cases is based on creation. And if you can nullify it in one instance, it becomes easier to nullify it in the other. Uh, just a couple of questions. Kevin McClure, I think I see, you want to stand up and tell us why this issue is important to you and why you, you wrote what you wrote and what you would tell uh, brothers and sisters gathered here to be thinking about. Here comes a microphone, Kevin. As always, Mark, thank you for the advance notice. <laughs> oh, I, I know you're always ready, brother. So uh, I heard Mike Law's study of 170 female pastors, and I thought, well, what does this problem look like in the entire convention? So basically me and a lot of just normal, average SBC members of local churches, uh, a lot of college students, a UPS worker, uh, got together and found a statistically significant uh, sample size so that we could get 99% confidence uh, to basically extrapolate Uh, how many female pastors are serving uh, in the SBC in the United States. And what we found was really, really shocking uh, because we we found over a thousand churches and almost 2,000 female pastors, uh, and many of which were senior pastors or co-pastors with their husbands. Uh, And even those numbers were very conservative uh, because there was a lot who had, as you mentioned, Jonathan, the title of minister, Uh, but they were listed under pastoral staff, and we didn't include them. Uh, And basically, you know, what Dr. Schreiner mentioned, you do see a connection between denominations who uh, ordain females as pastors and homosexual, pro-homosexual interpreters. They use those same interpretive pathways in order to argue for uh, the ordination of homosexuals. 
And so that was very concerning to me. And so I wanted the convention to know this problem is not a little problem because many people said to Mike, you know, this is so small, like this is just a drop in a bucket when there's 46,000 churches in the SBC. And so I wanted to show, along with over 40 SBC lay people, this is a problem that needs to be addressed because we have a wise God and he can be trusted. And when we obey him and his word, we actually find greater flourishing and we actually do the Great Commission better when we do all that Jesus commanded uh, everything in, in the whole Bible, all of it, is what Jesus has commanded us. And so that was my motivation in doing this study, so that we as Southern Baptists could fulfill the Great Commission, doing it God's way, and obeying everything that he's told us. I just want to throw something out to the panel. I think, yeah, I mean, I'm in agreement, but I, I wonder if... Some of the churches, maybe many of the churches, if they, if, if they call uh, a, a children's minister a pastor, it's, it's, it's not. So I, I don't want to argue in every case it's a liberalizing influence. Sometimes I think it's just ignorance. They're just, there's not an understanding. It's just sloppy. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't thought it through. So I, I think we want to make some distinctions. I don't want to say, well, every church that calls a female a pastor is necessarily has that agenda. So that's what I want yeah, to what throw Yeah, what I would say to that is they're building the camouflage that lets the other churches that do have that agenda come in. Even if that's not their intention, that is effectively what they're doing. And they need, they need better teaching. That's right. They should take more Tom Schreiner classes. Denny Burke, are you around? <laughs> Denny Burke, are you around? Denny, come on. You guys should know that when I sat down to write my just under 12 minute talk with nine points, uh, the way I researched is I you're looked pretty, up... You're pretty proud of that. Yeah, a little bit. That's true. I, I couldn't do that. What I did is I looked up things Denny Burke had written and read several articles Denny Burke had written. I'm pretty sure Denny topic. quotes you in his articles, but anyway. I don't know. Brother, the, any comments, any thoughts about well, what the What are we missing that we should be saying? Well, I you just should think stand that, up and look. Yeah, sure. I'm wearing the clothes I wore to the airport. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks for warning me here. Okay. Um, now, I, I just think that the, the amendment is important. Um, I, of everything that we're going to do at this convention this year, I do think that dealing with Saddleback correctly is the top. Um, if we don't get that right, that's, that's really bad. I think we're going to get it right. But the amendment is also important because the reason that we didn't deal with Saddleback well last year was because the credentials committee said, we don't know what pastor means. We should study this for a year. And so Mike Law has stood up and has said, well, why don't we just say in an amendment form what our, what our, our doctrinal statement already says? But Den Denny, hasn't the executive committee put out a response? Are you talking about today? Yeah. Yeah, they have. Well, and haven't they said we were clear enough? <laughs> they said something. They said that our uh, doctrinal statement's already clear, and we don't want to repeat our doctrinal statement inside of our um, constitution. constitution. We don't want to meld the two. Now, the problem with that is that we've already done that. We've done it like three times, two or three times since 2015. We've already named homosexuality, uh, sexual abuse, and racism three things that are in our doctrinal statement. We've said, okay, look, we are not going to cooperate. These are examples of the kinds of contradictions we are not going to cooperate with. But just as a simple matter of logic, if it were in fact clear enough, wouldn't the questions not be being raised? Um, that's that you're assuming that everybody knows what it means to be a Baptist. I think that you would not assume that, right? So people have forgotten our ecclesiology. The word pastor has a history and a meaning. You cannot understand this conversation if you don't understand that in the history of Baptist life, we have not made three offices. It's always been two offices. And what, what's being proposed is that there's, there's some third office of pastor. And by, friends, by two offices, he means elders and deacons. Yeah. Elders being pastors, bishops. All if, the same thing. If you're, if, if you're going to divide the office of pastor, we're back to three offices. And now we're making fundamental. This is an ecclesiological problem. For it's a gender problem. People have forgotten what our ecclesiology is. It, it has to be said the last few generations of Southern Baptist pastors have not been very concerned about polity. 
that, or that's ecclesiology. Correct. Or ecclesiology. And some of these things are just downstream from that. And so we're finding ourselves trying to explain to people, look, it doesn't matter if you're an associate pastor or a pastor. If you're a pastor, you're a shepherd and your orientation is toward the entire flock. A lot of people, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, what about um, people who are just women who are children's pastors? That's not, you could have, it could be a nomenclature thing, but really a pastor is oriented towards the entire flock. Um, even if, so if you have a man who's a children's pastor, he can do the weddings, the funerals, he could stand in the pulpit, right? And, and if you don't mean that about a woman who's on your staff and you're calling her pastor, you shouldn't call her pastor. Right. So that's back to Tom's point. He made that earlier. And the image I want to get in your mind, friends, is camouflage makers. Their intentions may be fine, but they are making camouflage for dangerous troops. So they may not mean to, but that is what they're doing. So they may or may not see that themselves, but if we see that, we are responsible. Caleb Morell has written, well, let me, let me, let me get, Caleb's written a, an interesting article that a number of us read, Harry Emerson Fosdick making some similar arguments 100 years ago at the Northern Baptist Convention to what we might be hearing this week. Yeah, well, the, the, in the Northern Baptist Convention, the issue was over open communion, and uh, f very famously in 1925, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was called to pastor what became River Riverside Church in New York City, and he was advocating for open communion, and the delegates argued, well, he shouldn't uh, be seated, he's not in keeping with Baptist practice regarding requiring believers' baptism for membership. And uh, the, uh, the, the president of the convention at the time said, well, we, we don't have a definition of what baptism is as a convention. That was his response. Uh, and so the convention floor voted, and they voted to seat them. And it was raised the next year, and the conservatives brought the motion to define what a Baptist church is. They, they brought the amendment that said, let's clarify once and for all, and their resolution lost. Uh, and uh, they failed to adopt the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. And we, we've seen what the trajectory of the Northern Baptist Convention was over the 20th century. The Southern Baptist Convention adopted a Confession of Faith in 1925, and that has served us well. And I think what we're just seeking to do is to abide by that. Because we all affirm that we believe in the Bible, but if we're not willing to clarify what we believe about the Bible, it calls into question whether we believe the Bible at all. Mike, you want to just explain the amendment for us? Sure, you can find a wonderful card, an amendment guide, if you will, on your seats provided. Thank you to Nine Marks for allowing me to have those placed out here. The, uh, the amendment, as it stands right now, you can find on the front of the card. Um, so the motion to amend the SBC Constitution, Article 3, Paragraph 1, it would be in Item 6. Um, this uh, affects the composition of the convention. Uh, and one of the requirements should we adopt this amendment would be that a church does not affirm, appoint, or employ a woman as a pastor of any kind. Um, so that's the amendment that I offered at last year's convention. Um, I, some of you may know uh, Juan Sanchez is gonna be on the panel tomorrow night. Uh, he, he, he wants to state the, the amendment positively. And so he and I talked on Friday or Saturday, it was about that. And uh, he and I worked on language and I'm, I'm grateful that he wants to do that. And so I expect that that will come on Wednesday, I think is when we're supposed to actually vote on the amendment. Um, so I would just encourage you all to so, accept. So, so Mike, speaking politically, anybody who might not want this amendment to pass is assuming that everybody will be there all concerned tomorrow because it's the first day of the convention and they'll be there all worked up about Saddleback, but they're gonna be over the exhibit hall, I've gone home on by Wednesday morning. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. You came to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, to take in the business, to receive the resolutions, to think deeply and carefully about them, uh, to be involved. You made the trip. The, I haven't had one of the French donuts yet, but I'm sure they're great. You know, so enjoy those, but come to the convention as well and be a part of the business. Uh, this is what we're here for. So you're advising us to actually come to the session on Wednesday morning. Yes, please be in the room when and where it happens. But you're saying also that Juan Sanchez is amending your amendment and you're in favor of it. Y yes, it, yes. Lord willing, that'll, that'll take place. And I would encourage us to receive Juan's positive language. Brothers, any final comments on this topic generally? Wilton? Yeah, I know many of us probably have loved ones who we care for that might 
be in uh, egalitarian situations and you've had these discussions with them. And, you know, I have seen in close loved ones, churches that that slippery slope, as we're calling it, it's not a farce. It's a reality. And so I just think we should exercise great care and wisdom and encourage one another, because I love being a part of a convention that holds to the authority of scripture. And so if we're gonna hold to the authority of scripture, let's put that into practice. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, I'd basically say the same thing. I think scripture is clear. I think our confession of faith is clear. I think we can move accordingly. Mike? I think being clear on this issue actually strengthens our cooperation together. Uh, once we agree on the office of pastor, we know who could be pastoring our churches. Uh, we're going to plant and missionaries who are going to be equipped to raise up pastors there. So I think that that's, this actually strengthens our cooperation if we're really clear on it. Yeah, and for, for me, I haven't totally worked this out in my mind yet, but there's a sense in which the authoritative structures that God has given us placed over natural differences between men and women in the, in, in, in the home and in the, in the uh, church, I think serve to preserve our very concepts of gender, of manness and womanness. So if you take away those structures, just wait a generation and you're going to have Supreme Court nominees who are asked the question, what is a woman? And she can't answer. I think a very understanding is preserve of man, woman is preserved somehow. And I haven't fully worked it out in my head, but but it preserves those those distinctions. Not only that, they're beautiful, glorious, God-given distinctions. And part of our conversation, I think something we could all get better at is describing the glory and beauty of what a man is and what a woman is, and why they're both such good gifts, to use that word. Right, and that, that's another way I'd like to see us keep pushing in this conversation. Mark, anything from you? Yeah, it's, it's not proud to repeat what God has said. It's humble to accept what God teaches us. It's a humility. It's a, it's a good practice. And the Lord is, in his kindness, giving us an opportunity to exercise that kind of loving, trusting humility before a world that will be misunderstanding and misrepresenting and hostile to it. And we have to trust the Lord has a purpose in calling us to humbly accept and repeat the truth and know that he will be honored by it. Amen. Uh, let's pray, then thank our guests, and then announcements. Tom, will you pray? Sure. Our Father, we give you thanks for this uh, gathering we've had tonight. Lord, we are uh, so thankful for the Word of God that clearly instructs us as to how we are to function as believers, as men and women, as uh, pastors and elders, overseers, and then deacons. Lord, we pray that you would guide our churches and that you would guide our convention, and we pray, Lord, that your will would be done in the meetings here this week even. We pray that you would guard and protect the Southern Baptist Convention. We pray that we, we would be faithful stewards of the truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.